Operations Cell Structure Protection Group on Commander 7. Go ahead, Rob. Got about three engine companies here. We're trying to, uh, Sizzling temperatures and dry conditions have fueled the 416 fire. The county manager has declared a state of local disaster. More than 2,100 homes are evacuated and more than 20,000 acres have burned just north of Durango. It's usually not the immediate fire that affects the fish population. It's the monsoonal rainstorm that happens afterwards. That rainstorm just sends tons of mud and ash and lots of nasty chemicals that come out of the soils and trees and it's toxic to fish. So we knew it was gonna be a devastating event. How did you explain to your wife that you were driving into a wildfire to rescue a fish? <laughs> She's used to it. I do have one fish joke. What did the uh, smallmouth bass say to the largemouth bass when he ran into the dam? Hey, you dumb bass. Oh boy. My name is Jim White. I'm an aquatic biologist for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. A lot of people have no idea, but it's an awesome job. I think the cool thing about fish is most people don't really get to know them. Fish do have personalities. They very much have a hen pecking order, particularly trout. A friend of mine one time said you, you couldn't help but be anything but a fish biologist, and he was correct when he uh, said that. Cutthroat trout are absolute jewel of a trout. Anybody that's ever seen one, they're, they're fantastic, but they're fairly delicate. They typically occupy sort of these more open reaches. That's probably why their coloration is the way it is. It's kind of that goldeny, bronzy color that matches really well if you're in a sunlit stream. Cutthroat trout were widespread before Western settlement. During that time, there was a destruction of not only the uh, natural environment, but also the introduction of non-native trout. Because cutthroat trout did not evolve with any other species of trout in the systems, they didn't evolve sort of defense mechanisms against increased competition and predation by these other uh, trout species, and so they quickly started to disappear. Just in the state of Colorado, we've learned a lot. In the last 12 years, have been very informative about the distribution of cutthroat trout. Way down in the southwest part of Colorado, where we are now, there's a uh, variation that we we're calling the San Juan cutthroat trout that's unique genetically. And that San Juan cutthroat trout was, as recently as just a few years ago, thought to be extinct. But uh, in 2018, using genetics from cutthroat trout in the area, we were able to trace back populations that we knew about and confirm that San Juan cutthroat trout were indeed still around. It was awesome to realize that those native fish were still present, but it was also somewhat terrifying recognizing that most of these populations that I was aware of were extremely small and vulnerable to things like wildfire. Why is it necessary to conserve species? <laughs> That's a great question. People might argue that, well, it's hair splitting. You know, we already had the Colorado cutthroat trout, and then we did genetic testing, and we realized that, wow, there's actually some subspecies of this, some different strains. 
And the question becomes, is it important to preserve that? It's a never ending chore to try and figure out how to manage land. Every piece of property you manage is unique. Banded Peak Ranch sits in the Navajo Basin, the upper Navajo Basin, and is essentially an, an entire watershed. It's 52,000 acres, and when you look at those 52,000 acres in, in a topography like this, I mean, that's a lot of land. It takes you a couple hours to drive around from one end to the other for sure. We typically get about 250 inches of snow a year. It gives us a pretty short window of time that we can do work, hauling livestock, hauling equipment, hauling logs around, that sort of thing. So uh, we got to run diesels just because I got the power to do it. Do you kind of develop like an emotional connection to your truck? I don't, absolutely not, no. I barely have an emotional connection to my family. <laughs> My name is Tim Harmon. I'm the ranch manager at the Banded Peak Ranch. There's a lot of water that comes off of this particular ranch, which is a drinking water source for cities like Albuquerque and Santa Fe. Unfortunately, if we were to get a catastrophic wildfire in here, it does a lot of damage to the soil, causes a lot of post-fire erosion. The primary reason we're working in the forest is to thin those forests so that when a, a wildfire does come through, it doesn't burn so hot. You end up with these big, what we call slash piles. One of the best ways to get rid of those and put those nutrients back in the soil is actually to light them on fire. I think it's absolutely important to invest in cutthroat. Anytime you have an opportunity to take a unique organism and preserve it and protect it, it's worth doing, worth the resources. If you're able to do that on an entire watershed, then you really you start to have a real impact. Population growth is a really major factor on wildlife throughout the Rocky Mountains. What you're starting to see is just loss of viable habitat. And obviously, kind of a, a warming trend is really showing a, a heavy impact, I think, in this region. When you start talking forest management or river restoration, those are, those are very expensive endeavors. It's typically at a pretty steep cost to ownership to manage their property. So this is where the 416 fire happened. We are at the southern end of the fire, uh, not far from where it started. And this was two years ago that it burned, but you can still see the large standing uh, dead timber from the severity of the burn. As the fire started really gaining momentum, we realized that two of our populations of San Juan cutthroat trout were in this drainage. We had worked out a deal with the Forest Service to mount this rescue. We had just a few hours to remove the fish from the stream. We had, I think, six miles of four-wheeler access, two and a half miles of, of hike, and we could see the fire growing in the, in the sort of distance and had to drive through the, the fire zone to get out of there. Once we got the fish back to the trailhead, um, we realized that we had a truck full of San Juan cutthroat trout, but that was just the start of a new journey. Hey Jim, how's it going? Good, how are you doing? Good, welcome back. Good to see you. On this ranch, we happen to have two of the six existing streams that have that San Juan strain of the Colorado Cut. Today, we took some fish that they raised in the hatchery and reintroduced them into a new stream. 
We needed partners with other streams that had San Juan cutthroat trout in them to, to step up and help us create more genetically diverse populations. Bandit Peak Ranch was ideal for setting up a pond that could strengthen the San Juan cutthroat trout populations. It's important to locate habitats that, that don't have non-native fish in them. They're pretty harmful to Colorado River cutthroat trout because they outcompete them, they prey on them, and they also hybridize. On public land, it's relatively rare to find a piece of water that hasn't already had non-native fish widely distributed in the uh, watershed above that lake. Having a really good working relationship with private land owners is critical. Bandit Peak Ranch has some of the most remote uh, headwater streams in the state of Colorado. The ranch has been incredibly conservation-minded and on board with uh, everything we've ever proposed, so it's been a wonderful partnership. Aldo Leopold said, you know, preserve every cog in the wheel because you may not understand how important that one cog is. That philosophy guides our management for cutthroat trout. Personally, I think that there's value in, in all of these species that we have. And I think there's probably a, a lot going on within ecosystems that we don't understand. As we lose that diversity, there's going to be impacts to those ecosystems. Private land holdings are critical for conservation of not just fish, but wildlife as well. They're undisturbed by the general public. They provide this sort of refuge from anglers. One of the beauties of private land is that you have an opportunity to experiment a little bit. As long as you're partnering with the right authorities, then you can have some real action-oriented projects and hopefully get results quickly. In this particular area, there's a really amazing effort at collaborative land management between the states, between the Forest Service, private landowners. There's a place at the table for everyone. I think there's real power in that. Releasing these fish into the wild is, is really a, an awesome feeling. They've had a lot thrown at them, but they're persisting. There are a lot of folks out there who really want to see native species flourish. That gives me hope about the future of cutthroat trout. Thank you.